Our lives, and the lives of our children and future generations are in danger. The Fukushima nuclear accident is the biggest threat that humanity have ever faced. And long before the fish die, they will become too radioactive for human consumption. Right now, more than 300 tons of the most radioactive contaminated water to ever be analyzed are being dumped into the Pacific Ocean every single day. That's right, 300 tons a day, and they currently have no method to stop it. Uh, and we really don't all know, uh, all know also what this radioactive water is doing to the Pacific, Jen. And I think a lot of people are very concerned about that. But this wasn't even in the mainstream press. It's, it's like Fukushima is going to blow up. The, U the U.S. is going to be evacuated. Japan, everyone in Japan. By the way, he's... Food chain remains contaminated for hundreds or thousands of years. And we'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia, I think, two to five years from now. This catastrophe is killing the life on the seas and is polluting with radiation the planet Earth. Every day since the accident began six years ago, 300 to 400 tons of water has poured into the Pacific. Is it possible that the Pacific could become devoid of fish as bigger fish eat smaller fish and transfer their onboard cesium-137 load? If there's another earthquake and building four collapses which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. Approximately 300 tons of water was filtering through the site until early this month, becoming laced with radioactive materials and then seeping into the sea. And he was saying if just one more earthquake, 7.0 or higher, happens, and he said there's a 95% chance that it will happen over the next three years, then Fukushima would just absolutely melt down and the U.S. would have to be evacuated. The only thing I can do if this really blows up is I'm, I've got to go to the Southern Hemisphere. Oh boy, Fukushima's been hitting the viral button again with such great headlines as Fukushima beyond urgent and Fukushima nuclear meltdown covered up. Radiation highest ever recorded 300 tons into the Pacific daily and other crank merchants like this. Fukushima, third of sea life dead, February 6th, 2017. And so it goes on. Humanity and all the life in this planet is in danger. And mainstream media, as usual, don't say a word about this important issue and keep us distracted with irrelevant things. Ah, yes, the evil mainstream media. It's such a good thing that there's alternative media to tell us the truth, like... Alex Jones and the Young Turks, right? And don't move people back in when there's radioactive boars on the loose. I know <laughs> exactly. boars are aggressive to humans without the radioactive. I mean, they are. I'm no expert, but they are. They so, are. I mean, I know people want to move home and all that, but that's yeah. That's some scary shit. First. Yeah. But all the cases of thyroid cancer and all of the different uh, mutagenic, which means the uh, uh, mutant-causing effects even in children, along the West Coast. Entire dialogue coming from Fukushima has been a lie. It is probably the most, uh, most detrimental and dangerous environmental disaster of all time. Uh, if you can go back to Sam Cohen, the former defense secretary, the ability to generate everything from earthquakes to tsunamis is a given. And I'm trying to think when it was, but anyway, it shows like blue beams going into the heart of the reactor. Now, whether you believe a neutron flux or not, what it indicates is somebody, even after generating the tsunami or the earthquake that generated the tsunami, wasn't satisfied with that. So they had to go and basically kick in a little extra help. Oh, yes. That's a first-rate alternative media. Or you could ask someone who actually works with ionizing radiation and uses that knowledge to keep his own ass safe. Okay, man. Geiger counters on. Oh. Ah, I suppose that's normal background radiation, the kind you'd find in any well-maintained nuclear facility. Okay, so goes up to about three. Or for that matter, playgrounds and hospitals. Or on a plane. Okay, so here we are on the ground, and our background radiation is about 12, it will take, about normal. But why am I not? 
not freaking out that I'm getting 30 times the background radiation on this plane. While radiation's a bit odd like that, the more of it you get exposed to, eh, the higher your chances of getting cancer. So I can see all these people turning white saying, oh my god, you're 30 times more likely to get cancer if you spend your life on a plane. Well, yes, but 30 times bugger all is still bugger all. The easiest way to understand these risks is to just compare them to the risk of, say, dying while driving. Again, there's this kind of linearity to it. The more you drive, the more likely you are to die on the roads. And it turns out that about a year's worth of background radiation gives me about the same chance of dying from cancer as driving about 1,000 miles. And seeing as your average American drives some 10,000 miles per year, that means that you're about 10 times more likely to die in a car accident on the roads than you are to die from cancer from the background radiation. Or another way of looking at it, you could live your whole life in an area with 10 times the normal background radiation. And even at that, you would only have comparable chances of dying from cancer from the background radiation as you do from driving your car. You see, the remarkable thing about radiation is you can detect incredibly small amounts of it. Now, a Geiger counter like this will set you back a um, couple of hundred dollars. Now, a gamma ray spectrometer is a little more exotic. They start at about $500. But with something like that, you can very easily quantify what radioactive elements are present. Now, detecting a radiation from a nuclear power plant is even easier, because many of the nuclear isotopes you're looking for do not occur naturally in any real quantity. So everything that you detect is contamination. So for instance, if you wanted to run a nuclear reactor, what you'd first do is you mine all of this naturally occurring uranium out of the ground. You actually mine the radioactive material to begin with. And then you bust up these uranium-235 nuclei in a reactor. Now those two fragments can be one of a variety of elements, and they're typically radioactive. But the most important fragments that we're going to look at are cesium, iodine and strontium. Now, even though it's the radiation from these that you're worried about, how these get into your body is a matter of regular chemistry, and we'll come to that shortly. So something to bear in mind is some of these fragments that you get are screamingly radioactive, others hardly radioactive at all. Generally, if something's got a half-life of about 4 billion years, about the age of the Earth, this is the case with the uranium isotopes, meaning that in the entire age of the Earth, only about half of the nuclei have emitted a radioactive particle. That's probably not going to be emitting much radiation. It's not something that you have to worry about too much. However, other isotopes can have very short half-lives, like, for instance, iodine-131 or its half-life is only eight days, which means that it is screamingly radioactive. It's putting out radiation about a billion times faster than uranium. But in two months, it's almost all decayed. It's only got about one half a percent of its initial activity. So it turns out that many of the nasty isotopes are the ones with intermediate range half-lives. So this is something that is almost entirely glazed over with most of the conversations about radioactive waste. Is the things with short half-lives, they don't sound so dangerous. You know, it's got a half-life of eight days or something, meaning that it's almost entirely gone within a year. That doesn't scare people, although those are the ones which really pack the punch. People are generally much more scared if you say it's going to be radioactive for a billion years. Radioactive iodine-129, its half-life is 17 million years, plus strontium, plus cesium, plus tritium, and I could go on and on and on. Even though the very material that you dug out of the ground to begin with to actually make the nuclear reactor has been radioactive for billions of years. So iodine-131 is almost entirely gone after about a year. Strontium-90 and cesium-137 are probably the nastiest of the decay products. Now, strontium is particularly nasty because it can bioaccumulate. And the reason it does this is because it is chemically very similar to calcium, which means that if you eat the stuff, it can get absorbed into your bones, where basically it sticks, which means that most of what you eat, you actually get the dose from. Now, none of this is a great problem for humans in that we can very easily detect 
strontium-90 and choose not to eat the stuff. And likewise, with animals, we don't generally eat their bones. But let's just say, take for instance, an example of bioaccumulation in the sea, where it would end up in an apex predator, like a killer whale or something. Like that. And sure, sooner or later, that killer whale is gonna die. Most likely, it won't be from the radiation. As you'll see, it's, it's quite hard to eat enough radiation to kill you. And when it dies, its bones sink and take all of that strontium with it. The bottom line is things that bioaccumulate tend to not be very mobile in the environment. They're kind of sticky. So another example of bioaccumulation would be iodine. And sure, iodine bioaccumulates in seaweed. I mean, iodine was first discovered in seaweed. But let's be real. In the five or so years since Fukushima, there isn't a single undecayed nucleus of iodine-131 left. Not that that will stop cringe like Alex Jones from trying to sell you a cure for it. I'm going to be honest. I mean, th th this is what I've said when I've talked about the nascent iodine that we've produced and we sell because all the scientists and doctors say this is the best thing for protecting your thyroid. But I guess I'll tell the crew, come with me if you want to go and we're going to have to like... Try to, I mean, this is like unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Yeah, bioaccumulation, when it doesn't even exist anymore, becomes kind of irrelevant. The cesium ion, however, is chemically kind of similar to sodium and potassium. You know, so sodium chloride, potassium chloride, cesium chloride. Okay, so that's sodium chloride. That's just what you put in your chips. No french fries, which is kind of salty. This guy here is potassium chloride, which is looks almost exactly the same as salt. But he's pretty disgusting, actually. It's pretty bitter. As is this guy, who's cesium chloride, and again, all of quite crystalline solids. And yeah, while they do actually do different things in the body, they're all kind of samey in their behaviour in that it would be expected that the cesium ion would go through your body at a similar rate to that that sodium does. You eat this stuff, you piss it out. In fact, all of the studies that I've seen, they reckon that you can get a bioaccumulation of about 100 times in sea life. But even at that, let's just take that number and roll with it. Now, remember what I said about you can measure very small quantities of radioactivity. Well, it turns out they've actually done that on several seawater surveys. I'll leave the link to the site below. You see, as there is essentially no naturally occurring cesium-137, any detectable quantity is multiples of background, which is how people usually like to state it, even if that quantity is almost not detectable. I mean, just look at that giant red spot off the coast of America. Between February 2014 and February 2015, the Fukushima 137 cesium signal doubled again to levels in excess of 4 becquerels per cubic meter in the upper 200 meters. North American coast will likely attain maximum values of at least 5 becquerels per cubic meter by 2015 to 2016. Which, of course, means this is going to destroy the wildlife population. I mean, that's what happened with Chernobyl and Fukushima, right? Uh, not quite so much. Turns out that nuclear disasters like this are fantastic for the wildlife. You see, it turns out that wildlife flourishes in a region where people have been excluded. Yeah, wildlife flourishes there, even with the meager disadvantage of having something like 30 times the natural background radiation, or about the radiation levels you'd get on a commercial jet at altitude. Now, don't get me wrong, 30 times background sounds horrible on a Geiger counter. But hey, doesn't stop billions flying per year. It's not that big of a deal. So yes, indeed, they have detected cesium-137 off the coast of America, and the only place that could have come from is Fukushima. But what is the actual measured value of cesium-137? Well, it's producing a couple of becquerels, that's a disintegration per second, per cubic meter. And at that point, this whole thing becomes an absolute joke. A cubic meter of water weighs about a ton. So let's say it's about the same weight as 10 people. 
So a human sized piece of water in about 100 kilos, 200 pounds, that sort of thing, would give off one tenth of a Baccarat. And now guess how many Baccarats a typical human puts out just from the naturally occurring radioactive isotopes in their body? About 10,000. The concentrated radiation would be starting to pile up along the west coast of the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and we really don't all know, all know also what this radioactive water is doing to the Pacific, Jen. And I think a lot of people are very concerned about that. You're about 100,000 times as radioactive as the radiation in the Pacific from Fukushima. That is, even if this was a thousand times worse, you would still be looking. Your natural background radiation just from your body would still be 100 times more radioactive than the Pacific would be from Fukushima. But what about the fish? Don't they bioaccumulate this? Of course, the, uh, the seafood, um, not only does the ocean's currents bring the radioactivity this way, but also uh, the sea life itself, the bluefin tuna, uh, migrated from Japan to North America and carried the radioactive cesium in its flesh over here. The food chain remains contaminated for hundreds or thousands of years and we'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia, I think two to five years from now. Well, let's give our fish 200 times the cesium radiation level of the water. So one ton a fish would contain about 200 becquerels of radiation from cesium, 200 disintegrations per second. Or looked at another way, eating just one kilogram of fish, one thousandth of that, that's two pounds of fish, would give you an amazing radiation dose of 0.2 becquerel versus your natural background radiation levels of 10,000 becquerels. More people die from not chewing their food properly. If you're looking for a hazard from the fish in the Pacific, it's choking on their bones. Here is a simulation model of the path of the cesium-137 released into the Pacific from Fukushima over a 10-year period. Two years after the first releases at Fukushima, a fish was caught close to the plant that had 7,400 times the government limit for safe human consumption. Cool, so let's take that example. The most radioactive fish found, the most, and it's 740,000 becquerels per kilogram. So if you were to eat an entire kilogram of that fish, you would become about 100 times more radioactive. Now, given that the 10,000 or so becquerels that your body emits is about a tenth of the total background radiation that your body's exposed to, that means that eating one kilogram, two pounds, of the absolute most contaminated fish found at Fukushima would give you about the same radiation dose as flying on a plane at altitude. And you would experience that dose until you excreted the cesium. So let's just make a first degree approximation that cesium is biologically similar to sodium. So there are studies that have looked at the biological half-life of sodium in the body. That's basically how quickly your body turns over this iron. And it turns out you would excrete about half of that cesium in about a month. That means that eating the most radioactive fish at Fukushima would probably give you a lifetime dose of something along the lines of choosing to be an airline pilot. But you know what? We didn't eat those fish. And they're probably a lot less radioactive now. The simulation shows how cesium-137 released by the meltdown has been traveling across the Pacific for nearly six years now, but its impact is just starting to be noticed. But let's take a look at the ocean, the big ocean, the Pacific, where it's, it's been contaminated by this great plume, yes? Well, it turns out there have actually been studies done on the cesium levels in the tuna, and they can get screamingly radioactive, up to 200 milli becquerels per kilogram. That's 0.2 becquerels per kilogram, which means kilogram for kilogram that bananas are over a thousand times more radioactive than the tuna from the Pacific. Yep, bananas naturally contain a lot of potassium. 
and potassium is weakly radioactive. Look, there's a very simple reason why the paranoia merchants focus on scary numbers like 300 tons of radioactive water per day. But this wasn't even in the mainstream press. It's, it's like Fukushima's gonna blow up, the, U the US is gonna be evacuated, Japan, everyone in Japan. By the way, he's- Right now, more than 300 tons of the most radioactive contaminated water to ever be analyzed are being dumped into the Pacific Ocean every single day rather than the actual measurements of what's actually in the environment. And this is one of the reasons why I actually got this gamma ray spectrometer. Because guess what? This summer, I'm actually going to the beaches of California to measure for myself what radioactive elements are there. Because I happen to know that those beaches are actually naturally pretty radioactive with things like uranium and thorium. So let's take a look at three radiation sources I actually have. Let's start off with a simple Geiger counter, which just measures the high energy particles that come off this material. Okay, so this is what just regular background sounds like. Just one there's no radiation sources nearby. That's about normal, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, that sort of background. So this is Fiesta Ware, it's a uranium glaze pottery. So all the uranium is in the, it's just in that very thin layer on the top. And then people used to eat off this, which isn't actually that big of a deal, as long as you don't eat the glaze. But, let me just so you actually know, this stuff is screamingly radioactive. But it's only alphas, so I mean, you, you get a little, a little distance away from this and it, it's not that big of a deal. Right. So, you know, it's just the radiation from where my hands are here. It, it's got no real penetrating power. So this is what uranium uh, or fiesta wear is like. Okay, so here I've got some thorinated welding rods. 2% thorium in these welding rods. And again, thorium is a sort of weak alpha emitter. So, that's higher than background. Background's about point one or something. So there it is, the dreaded cesium. 137. So, this is a spark gap. So, you basically need some ionizing radiation in there to help it sort of get a spark going across the, the gap. And so, let's see what cesium 137 is like. So the cesium-137 is a pretty modest outing. Okay, so that's the Geiger counter. This guy here is a gamma ray spectrometer. Um, so in there, there is a crystal of sodium iodide, I think it is in this one. And up here you've got a photomultiplier tube. So what happens is your high energy photon comes in here, where it hits at some point the uh, sodium iodide crystal and gives off a flash of light and that flash of light is of characteristic intensity uh, which is related to the energy of, of the gamma ray and seeing as nuclear decays give off characteristic uh, wavelength gammas you can actually identify from the, the, from the intensity of that light pulse what the element was that actually decayed. So what I'm going to do now is show you that for my three radiation sources, just to show you that you really can quite simply identify these radiation sources. Okay, so what I'm going to do is first of all is just record a background. I'm going to do this for about, I don't know, a couple of minutes or something. So, first of all, we're going to do the spark gap, okay? Let's put my spark gap there. 
and we're going to start off and again instantly you can see the cesium uh, 137 <laughs> that's how easy it is to spot right and this is something that you could barely detect with the Geiger counter yeah and that's how easy it is to detect the gammas from cesium 137 this is what they usually use to calibrate these spectrometers because it's about I forget what it is, 650 kilo electron volts or something, half a mega electron volt. Okay, so here we go with the thornated welding rods. And we prop that up somewhere around there somewhere. Oops. Yep. Ah, let's use a block of tin, that should work. And you can see the thorium in there already. This is the thorium here. And you've got another peak down here. Okay, so that's about five minutes. So we've got all sorts of peaks in here. Okay, so now let's take a look and see what it's like for uranium. Now, uranium, you will recall, was screamingly radioactive. So I'm just going to drop that in there. And we're going to start counting again. Okay, so that's about five minutes for uranium. <laughs> As you can see, all of these things have pretty characteristic spectra to the point where you really, really wouldn't have any problem in identifying the cesium-137. Right? I mean, it's that quick. That's how quickly you can identify even a relatively weak source of cesium-137. And it would be so much more impactful if these people, rather than banging on about how many tons of water have leaked, if they actually just showed the radiation levels of cesium-137. You know, the ones that's currently about one disintegration per second per cubic meter of seawater. And if you want to enable more crazy-ass projects like this one, you can support this channel directly through Patreon. And I'd be very grateful to have you as a supporter.